All right, good morning. We're going to get started with an invocation from Councilman James Greiner and a Pledge of Allegiance led by Councilman Mark Stonecipher. Please play, uh, bow your heads and pray with me. Dear God, thank you for uh, giving us this uh, nice weather today and uh, that we can come and gather together and uh, review the upcoming year's budget. And I pray that you would uh, cause us all to um, ask intelligent questions and uh, and really come to a good conclusion and uh, the, because we want to be a good steward of of uh, our citizens' money. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, I call this meeting of the City Council to order. We have no business from the Office of the Mayor. Uh, and we do have, of course, this is generally designed to be a budget-only uh, meeting and sort of the off weeks in between our regular council meetings. But we did have an item um, <clears throat> that uh, demanded to be heard today due to some deadlines that are pending. And this is found under 4A, items requiring separate votes. This is item uh, A, ordinance on final hearing relating to drainage and flood control. We had a presentation two meetings ago, uh, then a public hearing, and now we are at potential final consideration uh, of this ordinance. So I would take a motion. Move the ordinance. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Is this, uh, yeah, don't we need actually, uh, do we have enough? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yes, yeah, so that's seven votes, right? So we have exactly that. And uh, now can you, <laughs> it's a comedy of errors. Now can you uh, put uh, Councilwoman Nice's voter voting machine back on? <laughs> All right, passes unanimously and with the required number of votes for an emergency. Okay. Oh, we need a second vote on the emergency? Okay, all right, motion on the emergency? Move, move the item as an emergency. Okay, we got a motion and a second. Any discussion on the emergency for item 4A? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. And again, with the required number of votes for an emergency. That brings us to 4B. Okay, so I know this can seem complicated because we talk about the budget meeting after meeting after meeting, but this is the official legal required public hearing uh, regarding the budget, and so uh, this is item 4B, public hearing regarding proposed annual budget for fiscal year 2020. So this is an opportunity. Obviously, citizens have opportunities to come to these meetings over the next several weeks to hear these presentations and talk about the budget. But for legal purposes, this is the official public hearing for the budget uh, as it is considered in the process. Is there anyone here who wishes to speak under this public hearing portion of the 2020 budget? Seeing none, we'll move on to item 5, presentations and discussion of FY20 proposed budget. Mr. City Manager. Yeah, so we've got four presentations today. The budget was introduced on the 30th of April. We'll have four presentations today. We'll start off with uh, Shad Meldrum from Information Technology. Good morning, Council, Mayor, new City Manager, our new Council members. Uh, my name is Shad Meldrum. I'm the Information Technology uh, Director. Uh, <clears throat> our budget begins on page C71, if you care to look at that. And the uh, performance supplement is on page uh, G60. So I'll jump in. So the department mission, the mission of the information technology department is to provide business solutions and technology services to city departments so they can better serve the Oklahoma City community. So you'll see that's a picture of our uh, 
Open Data Portal, it's available on OKC.gov for citizens to access information. Uh, there were about 450,000 data sets queried last year from that system, so that helps with open record requests. Next slide. Uh, major budget changes for FY20. Uh, personnel cost is $527,000 increase. Uh, <clears throat> we work with budget beginning back in October to go through our contracts and things are going to increase, and so there's $1.4 million increased on uh, things that were already in place. Uh, the biggest increases was Microsoft licenses, so we appreciate council and city management. Uh, purchasing Microsoft uh, technologies that we needed for increased security within the uh, city. The other big one that we added was the 911 switching call processing system maintenance. Uh, moving down, some new uh, projects for this year. The operational increases for new systems was 290,000, and I'll talk about these uh, coming up. But the newsletter and email text subscription software, we estimate 150,000. We're working with PIM and many departments on that one. Uh, case management for municipal counselor's office is 70,000. And then we're already in process on LFR performance management software, and that's at 70,000. Next slide. So our department structure, uh, we're staying uh, this year at 111 positions. So this is the way we're structured within the department. Uh, under administration, there's five lines of business, which is our LFR lines of business. Under uh, those lines of business, there's actually 14 programs. Uh, within the parentheses there, you see our staffing of the 111 positions within each, within each one of those programs. So we, we always say, as far as the IT department and resources, we're fairly thin for the amount of stuff that we're uh, managing and take care of. So we rely heavily on uh, users within departments to help us uh, keep all these systems running. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce uh, Felice Ponkilla. She's over administration and helps put together this whole budget every year. Like I said, we start in October with all this, so we start before departments looking at stuff that's going to go up for next year. So it does seem like sometimes that we budget year-round with NIT. Uh, customer support, uh, we're currently down two division managers, which we're in the process of hiring right now. So we have uh, five uh, or four division, division managers total. Uh, before I move there, I want to introduce David Grothy. He's our assistant director. Uh, David's been with the city 40 years, so lots of knowledge within his head. Uh, Felice has been here 41 years, so definitely a lot of time there, too. Uh, Kerry Wagnon is over the public safety support. Uh, he's been with the city 30 years. And then Ralph is over our uh, security line of business and division, keeping everything secure as possible. Uh, he's been with the city 11 years, but before that was in the police department for 28 years. Uh, I've been with the city almost 20 years now and been IT director for just about 10 years. Uh, within this, I want to note, and I watched the last uh, budget presentations talking about, you know, downturns in the economy and things like that. Uh, we're at 111, but if you were to look all the way back at uh, 2002, we were at 103 positions. So as far as growth within IT, we're doing more and more with fewer and fewer people, and so I'll go into how we're able to do that. Uh, <clears throat> my first year as director was a tough year. That was uh, FY11. Across the city departments, we're asked to make a cut, and we actually cut 12 positions that year. So in FY11, we we're actually at 85 positions, so we've grown back since then, which we definitely appreciate. Next slide. Our FY20 proposed budget, so we're, total will be 29, just over $29 million. This gives you an idea of, by line of business, how it breaks down. So roughly equal to positions, but also for the amount of stuff that has to be taken care of. So we centralized IT within the city, so all the management of software, hardware, paying contracts, and all that is all centralized within IT. So we make sure all that happens, and that's why you see the numbers there. Uh, next slide. So <clears throat> I believe that we're the only internal service department that will do a presentation. So as I said in our mission, our job is to serve the other departments so they can serve the residents. So we work through them to try to provide quality services and better services and more efficient services to residents. But in that end, we have to charge back all of our costs to our customer departments. So this is the internal city departments, and this is what it would look like if you, when we break it down and charge back to departments. So I note every year, if you look, uh, police, fire, and courts, which we our public safety departments account for 54% of our chargebacks. So 
more than half of what we do is for those customer departments. Uh, the next going around clockwise, uh, utilities, transit, airports, and zoo are our trust departments. They take up almost, uh, get us to the next uh, three quarters of the budget. So beyond that is the general fund departments and supporting those guys. Uh, next slide. So strategic issues, this comes out of LFR. We, way back when, when we did LFR and, and we met with NIT and, and talked about our strategic issues, I think we had five. We boiled it down to these three. These have been fairly static for the last couple years, but these are the biggies. So the biggest one we look at is system security and data integrity. I mean, that's the primary thing we do. I talked about we have a security line of business, but within IT and within the customer departments, I mean, security is everybody's job. I mean, down to the user and training every year. So our measure that we do, we have within there, one of the big ones that we report up is that 95% of business system configurations will match the approved configuration standard. Uh, we continue to tighten up what that standard is. So we've kept it at 95 and we continue to be more and more strict about what that standard is. And departments are really good about working with us and understanding that you know, we, we have to have things a certain way to make sure everything's secure. Uh, the next one is a big one, growing demand for technology. And I showed that as red because this is one of our biggest areas. Uh, we added this measure this year, which is really a summary measure at the strategic level because we were measuring this within each program. But we measure <laughs> capacity within the program to meet the customer demand and customer being our internal city departments. So currently, and I, I put that as only 43%, only 43% of our programs, our 14 programs, have the capacity to meet the project demand. So you would say, well, what is that? That means and when a department asks for a project, how much, how many teams are staffed enough to do that in a reasonable amount of time? Uh, currently on the books, I looked just yesterday, and we have 484 projects on the books waiting to be done. Uh, IT staff are really good because we love solving problems. So when departments come to us, I mean, they, they love to jump in the stuff. Uh, we have to control our team leads to make sure that they don't, you know, department whatever wants to do something, they'll tend to try to do that first. But we have a whole process where we do this kind of like a emergency room triage where we try to, you know, look at the projects, bang for the buck, you know, what comes first. So definitely a lot of demand. Uh, the third one is advanced skill sets, and I show that as green because in FY11 when we had the big, or not FY11, but in FY17 we had another cut and we cut our training budget, which actually impacted IT pretty heavily because we cut some of the critical training we needed to support these systems. So we worked with the budget actually last year to add back to that and make sure that within IT that we have the training dollars we need to, to take care of these systems effectively. So. That's actually close to 100% right now, so that's really good. But I will say, uh, right here, we talk about advanced skill sets in our measure. That's both for IT and for the users. And there's been a lot of changes in the environment the last year with pushing out Windows 10 and multi-factor authentication and all that. So we're going to be looking at ways to do more training for our users coming up in the next year. So next. So going into the lines of business, uh, the first one is technology infrastructure. They provide security, network, server, telecommunications, and client configuration services to city departments. So as I say each year, we, security is highly important to us, but we maintain a low profile, because certainly what you don't want to do is brag about how secure you are and invite people to test that. So uh, definitely a high priority within IT. And we're recently, we've gone through two uh, presentations of the audit committee just focused on security and where we're at, which I know Councilman Greenwell and McAtee have been there. Uh, giving you an idea of the size of the, this line of business, there's 4,677 4, licensed users around the city. That's using Microsoft software and other products, and there's 4,500 computing devices have to be managed, and that's where that setting a conf configuration standard, making sure all those devices meet that standard is critical. There's 12,000 network connections over 160 sites. And I don't have to tell you that Oklahoma City, when you compare to other cities, is unique because we have 620 square miles. So services are out, you know, fairly far out there and fire stations, you know, out in areas that it's hard to get network connections to them. So that's a tough job for the network uh, team. There's 300 users and five call centers. Last year they received 2.1 million calls. You're talking 
utility customer service, action center, courts, and, and those guys. So we maintain the call centers for those. 946 servers, which is a lot, uh, but we virtualize those servers. So we're able to do this as effectively as possible with minimal hardware. So 89% uh, virtualized. And I'll speak to network and server here. This is where the advanced skill sets come in because to be able to manage virtualization on that level and network across that many connections requires advanced skill sets. So we've been able to continue to expand this without asking for more staff. Uh, of those 946 servers, 637 are production. Uh, there's 3.3, uh, 3,331 terabytes, or as I keep trying to say, 3.3 petabytes of storage within the city. So that's a lot of storage. I think two years ago or three years ago, I looked and we had more storage within the city than Netflix had for all of their library. So lots of data has to be backed up and managed. Next slide. <clears throat> Uh, before I jump on the customer support, I, I wanted to know infrastructure, jump right past them. There's a whole bunch of projects they did last year that for you guys and non-technologists aren't necessarily that interesting, but uh, something that gets underappreciated a lot is these guys will take, I mean, they're already planning for upgrades on Memorial Weekend and stuff like that. So a lot of stuff happens after hours and they get a three-day weekend and they use that to, to do work. So a uh, tremendous commitment from that staff. So customer support, uh, this is where uh, we have a help desk so that the users will have a problem. They have one number to contact. They don't have to understand, do I need to call network team? Do I need to call server team or some application team? So they call customer support. So they provide a single point of contact for customer technical support needs and rapid restoration of normal services. So estimating this year at the pace we're at now, they're gonna have about 23,000 contacts to service desk. And what we've done is the problems that are uh, easier to solve are fairly routine. We, the teams, have given them the information and kind of a cookbook of how to go solve those problems for users. So a user can call there and hopefully get their, pro their problem solved. The bigger issues, of course, I have to go to the team level. Uh, they themselves did 6,700 work requests. Uh, they're actually managing computing devices, so desktops and laptops, and they manage 3,640 uh, 3, uh, computing devices. And then cellular data management, this is something that we centralize within IT. Uh, we try to make sure for all these cellular devices that we get the most effective plans. Uh, when we talk about cellular data modems, I talk about 620 square miles. So a lot of stuff has to be connected by cellular networks. And so we're doing that as effectively as possible by pulling those data plans across all departments. So rather than an apartment maybe buying 10 and getting a pooled plan, we try to pull all this together. So uh, some examples of what that is, because that looks really high if you're talking data modems. Uh, with, the, with the bond issue, there was a plan to, uh, to work on some corridors for improved uh, traffic uh, synchronization. So we worked with Public Works years ago, and we were able to put all of our traffic signals on the cellular network. So rather than doing just some corridors, all 700 plus traffic signals are on there, and I know Public Works is putting the school flashers on this summer, so they'll be managed through that system. But uh, this is interesting because, I mean, we talk about innovation and all that. When we took this to the traffic management company, they had never done this anywhere. And in fact, their software wasn't capable of doing that. So it was Oklahoma City that worked with these guys on changing their programming and how their networking works so this could happen. So we were the first one to do that. And then now that's, that's something they use, you know, across the nation for their customers. Next slide. Uh, customer support, if we look at uh, LFR results. And these results right here say customer support, but they report for the entire department. So these measures right here are department-wide for the entire IT department. So whenever we finish a work request for a, a customer, they get a feedback. Uh, I looked and there were 1,150 uh, responses to those feedback surveys. And our target is to do 95% uh, uh, satisfaction or 96%, so that's really good. Uh, another one we look at is how many incidents, and an incident is when something's broken. A user's not able to do something or something's not working like it's supposed to. So that's an incident, and we want those done in four operational hours. I'll note the four operational hours is something we've discussed within LFR for years, but that actually matches a, a response we give for ICMA uh, on an annual basis. Uh, and we target 75% across the department, and we're at 
I looked uh, with budget or finance and uh, other cities that report ICMA, I used the last four years and it was at 62%. So we're above other cities on four hour response. <coughs> Slide. So our next one is public safety support. Uh, they provide public safety applications, systems, communications, and 911 facility management for the city. So of course, when we talk public safety applications, they are critical systems that have to be maintained. So this is why we uh, put this within its own line of business. Uh, we manage uh, the public safety communication center. So the center over there, we manage the desks. I mean, we have budgets to replace the chairs and monitors and everything. And you know, when the AC goes out, of course, we'll contact general services, but we have response responsibilities for that. So we manage that center. Uh, we have two staff over there that provide dedicated support. So they're stationed over there for anything they need, whether it's help with the system or, or anything with the facility. Uh, there's 182 outdoor warning sirens. So that's what it takes to cover 620 square miles. Uh, there's 901 uh, vehicle mounted mobile data computers. That's in for public safety vehicles. So they have basically desktop access within the police vehicles. Uh, there's 5,281 user radios, which you'd say, well, that seems like a lot for the staff we have. Uh, the reason there's 5,281 is because over the years with the quality of our radio system, uh, other cities have contacted us and wanted to join in. Of course, with our coverage, we, there's some island jurisdictions and some that uh, we can cover. So currently, the city of uh, Bethany, Bethany, Mustang, War Acres, Yukon, uh, Oklahoma City Community College is on, Oklahoma City Housing Authority, uh, Putnam City School Security, Oklahoma City University recently came on, and then just this time last year, the Oklahoma County Sheriff came on. So they're all on our, our radio system. Of course, they have their own talk groups, but this helps. This is a benefit to Oklahoma City because now our public safety personnel are able to talk to them with, within our radio system. Uh, Norman is going through a, a radio upgrade right now, and there's opportunities to improve uh, communication with them. Uh, we're getting inquiries. Since Oklahoma County Sheriff came on, there's the potential that they will uh, turn off their radio system soon, which could, uh, out in eastern Oklahoma County, could uh, mean that those jurisdictions have to switch. So there's uh, light contacts from Luther, Jones, Forest Park, and Choctaw. Uh, the other thing we're actually talking right now at Oklahoma City Public Schools are looking at funding for potentially bringing some of their stuff on. So I think they're trying to see what funds they have available and how much they'll implement within the Oklahoma City Public Schools to be on a radio system. Uh, I'll note also uh, working with uh, the fire department, we implemented mutual aid with UConn. That was patterned after setting up mutual aid with Mustang and that's where if there's a big fire or whatever, then we can, we, and Mustang can call on each other to respond to a fire. So uh, I know when we were setting up UConn that uh, the fire chief reported within the first hour of setting up the test that we actually had that work actually. So uh, we learned, did some lessons learned on UConn. We're gonna go back and redo Mustang, but this might be something we start to set up with other jurisdictions. So that basically ties together the 911 systems for uh, fire. Okay, next. Oh, can you go back real quick? I want to note too, uh, when you look at the size of the public safety team uh, out there at 15th and Portland, we actually do all the outfitting. You can see in the lower uh, left-hand corner a picture there, we outfit the police and fire vehicles. So it's not just technology because of the quality of work that uh, some external uh, vendors they were having. We actually put in the cages and everything within those. So the vehicles show up and we, the IT staff basically outfits the vehicle uh, top to bottom. And so that, we did 185 last year. Next slide. So public safety support highlights. Uh, we're going through a P25 radio system upgrade, which really just means that's a new federal standard. It's an open standard. So we're switching from our current EDAC system, which is proprietary to a P25 system. So hopefully by the end of this calendar year, we're switched over. But police and fire and public safety will be first. So in the fall time frame, we'll be moving them over. Another thing that came up in reviewing the current radio system was that we need uh, improved coverage out uh, in eastern uh, Oklahoma City, which a uh, product of that will help the jurisdictions that may want to come on in Oklahoma County, but that definitely wasn't the driver for this. But the recommendation from the consultant we hired was that we add a new tower. 
with Fire Station 4 being out there, that's a perfect location for it. So we're adding a new tower at Fire Station 4. Uh, we went live with police records management system. So I want to thank Chief City. We were able to get that done with his support and assigning staff to help that. And I know during his presentation, he talked about the NIBRS reporting and, you know, for FBI and some of the new requirements of that, which, you know, at the federal level, they keep giving jurisdictions more time to do. But that was something we made sure happened when we went live with this. So pushing that vendor to make that happen. And you can see in the lower uh, left-hand corner there, that's a screenshot of the data entry from the field. So those officers are actually doing their data entry from the field, which increases efficiency and does those NIBRS checks uh, from the field. So that's a huge improvement with that system. Like I said, 185 public safety vehicles will be outfitted. Uh, we're getting close on text to 911. I know council has asked about this for a couple years. So we worked with, uh, we worked with 911, Jamie O'Leary and the police and fire department to get that in place. Uh, we're in the last stages of testing with carriers. They have to do all their certification and testing. And then ACOG is going through the same thing because they support uh, non-Oklahoma City call takers. So we're close on that. Hopefully within the next couple months, there'll be a go live. Uh, RFP for fire records management system is, is about to be pushed out. So we just finished police records management. And now we're jumping in the replacement of fire records management. Next slide. Uh, the next line of business is technology application support. They provide enterprise application support services, including patches, upgrades, enhancements, customizations, training, troubleshooting, and vendor management. Vendor management is a lot of work sometimes. So when you talk about this group, there's uh, primarily two teams under it, but when you talk about critical uh, city systems that have to be up and working for the city to do business, of course, PeopleSoft, HR and financials, timekeeping system, cash sharing systems around the city, uh, NeoGov for recruitment, which we're looking at expanding with the personnel department and doing some other functions, uh, risk management, which is a system called Origami, if you hear about that. That's something we put in about this time last year and replaced the other system. Uh, supporting utilities with SAP, uh, e-bidding, that's bid sync, so we can do all of our bidding online, which is a huge improvement because of the process that we used to use in the past because a lot of these vendors are already registered with that and receive notifications from anything we send out. Uh, service and work order systems, which you may hear the product CityWorks is used in several departments around the city. Service and requests, code enforcement and permits, that's a CELA that's used in Action Center and over in Development Services. and and uh, within uh, public works also. Animal welfare is a product called Chameleon, so that helps their response. Fleet and fuel management, M5, agenda management, which we're switching the prime gov. You've heard of SIRE, which is what we're on right now. And when I say vendor management, we get caught sometimes, you know, us in the departments when vendors buy out companies. And so, I, you know, that's kind of what happened with SIRE. They got bought out and it wasn't necessarily clear what they wanted to do, but we're going through a process right now, switch that over. You may hear from your constituents because this causes issues with browser support and even within the city, we're still having to run some users on old, the old Windows 7 just to support Sire. So we're definitely pushing to get that, that done. And that'll have improvements for, you know, going through the agendas and doing your own annotation on your iPad and things like that. So we're definitely looking for big improvements with PrimeGov. Document management, venue and event management is Ungerbach with Parks Department and of course GIS systems. Okay, next. So looking at uh, LFR results within the application support group. So the two top ones I highlighted there are the same thing. Whenever they finish the work request, the survey goes out and those two teams, you can see the feedback, our target is 95% on the far right and they're at 99 and 98%. So our users are definitely getting support from the application groups that they're expecting. And then the same thing, res incidents resolved in four operational hours for both enterprise applications, and departmental systems. They're way above the 75% at 96 and 94%, which is really good. Uh, we set the 75% target across the board. Uh, that's something we look at every year. Do we up the application groups or not? Uh, we decide to keep everybody consistent. And like I said, the ICMA that I just checked the last since 2014 of all cities was at 62%. Okay, next. Uh, project highlights from application support. So we've kind of reached a little bit of a saturation on field computing users. There used to be lots of requests from departments to do more and more stuff from the field. Like I said, that's where you see the, the cellular modem, you know, counts way up to get users of the field that are running, you know, seems like sometime halfway between here and Tulsa as you get, 
you know, definitely out there east to get them connected, they're on LTE. So that's how they're able to do all the stuff in the field. But now we're, we've got 350 field for people, uh, users actually doing stuff in the field. And not just that, people that have smartphones are able to, from the field to respond by email to resident questions and things like that. So definitely where people, staff would come in, print out their day's work and then leave and then come back and maybe call residents and all that. Now it's all happening during the day, during their, their regular business. Uh, PrimeGov uh, implementation to replace Sire is ongoing. Uh, data analytics web app, which uh, working with uh, development services, we're, uh, that's funded and we're gonna push that out. That's a product that'll let citizens basically do their own somewhat open record requests against a permit system. So it's GIS based, it's got pie charts, it's got all kinds of stuff. So uh, that'll improve access to what's happening within the permit system within the city. Uh, cell of configuration, uh, online permits, and lots of new ordinances went in this last year with uh, strong beer and wine, purchasing mechanical and plumbing residential permits online, uh, home sharing licenses, sale of recreational permits in a cell, uh, pre-qualified contractor licensing. So, of course, this is stuff that all comes through council, and then we have to, you know, scramble to get the system to accept this and be ready for this uh, when all that goes live. Uh, continuous enterprise system upgrades, enterprise system, we're talking about PeopleSoft and cash sharing. Uh, this is a change. It used to be these vendors like Oracle that owns PeopleSoft would, you know, plan a major upgrade every two years. Now, because they do more stuff with cloud services and all that, they pretty much are doing it continuously. So these teams have switched from, you know, planning a multi-million dollar every other year upgrade to now this stuff is just happening all the time. And, and that involves user testing and all that. So definitely an impact on IT and an impact on our, our users within departments. And then 911 CAD, the chameleon interface, this is something we completed. So used to be the animal welfare officers would have to work in chameleon and then calls that came in through 911 would go into the CAD system. So they were jumping between two systems within their vehicles there. You can see the lower right hand right. So uh, what we did is we interfaced those systems. This happened, we did this within IT so that those calls could come in, they could just work within Chameleon, which you're most comfortable with. Next. Uh, technology enhancements, uh, line of business. They provide technology identification, business analysis, custom application development, data management, project management, implementation services, the city department. So a huge function here, and this is one of our, our lowest staffed uh, line of business. Uh, our development team, they currently main, have developed or maintained 43 custom applications and interfaces. This is where a department wants something that we can't find out there and nobody offers that product or we want to tie two systems together. So some examples, I talked about data.okc.gov, uh, police activity trackers, a special function that they wanted. Courts online payment is developed by us. Uh, the whole budget management app that all departments use to compile their budgets and submit it to finance was developed. Uh, internal and the big one we did a couple years ago was hotel motel tax which we're uh, enhancing right now so that they can uh, uh, prepay some of that so that's something that improves that whole process uh, within enhancements is our data management group which we've talked about for years within LFR is a little bit of a strange place for them to land they maintain the production databases but they're in enhancements because when you talk about SharePoint and document management and things like that those are things that uh, the departments need. It's kind of a, a development type thing, but there are 406 production databases have to be managed around the city. And then within this, when the department has a need, we uh, document that need, we record it. We have a process where we go through and we work with the department, do a business analysis to figure out it is what they want to do, gather requirements, and then we in IT will run the whole RFP process for them. So that's to make sure that these technology projects are done as successful as possible. We make sure the department gets exactly what it is they're looking for. And we, we tell people, be careful when you go to conferences and you see a software. We try not to do it the back way where we see a software and then realize that there's a need. We don't want to buy software ahead of actually doing this process. So I think departments are really good about understanding because it takes time to go through that, but that definitely makes sure that it's successful as possible. But they follow Project Management Inst Institute standards and processes to do that. So next. Uh, project highlights within enhancements, of course, we're, we're doing the agenda management system implementation right now with the primarily city clerk's office, and I think that's going well. Uh, we're pushing to, to get it done as quickly as possible. 
Electronic plan review is uh, in process right now. We got the RFP drafted, so that's going out to review. We built in all the workflow in Ocella for, for plan review. Now it's making the electronic lease, and this is where plans can be sent, submitted electronically. They'll all be done electronically within the city so that right now where it's a paper process and things might happen in series, which could go slow. Now different processes can happen in parallel. So uh, once we can't really give a time frame till we get proposals and those vendors give us their time frames, but that's definitely something we look to have going this year, this uh, fiscal year. Uh, LFR performance management software, we're just about done gathering your requirements. So you saw that was funded with the 70,000. That's something we're looking at getting implemented, improve reporting to residents and getting things out on OKC and then improving reporting within the city. I know it's a little, little bit of an issue sometimes trying to manage you know, what's put in and making sure it's accurate and, and complete and everything within the city. So this software will help us do that. A big one working with PIM. This is something we actually submitted last year. Newsletter, email, and text subscription software. It came up late and I would admit maybe we hadn't formulated exactly what it was we wanted to do working with PIM, but now uh, it didn't get funded. So what we realized was lots of departments around the city uh, were looking at doing something similar. So we didn't want this splintering off and having departments start to do their own thing. And then residents are getting you know, one type of communication from utilities and then something from PIM and all that. So we gathered everybody together and said, you know, let's make sure we do this as one solution. So we did a business analysis back in last year in July. And then for the first time, we'd never done a request for information from IT, but we did this to try to get an idea who out there could do what. We knew it was available from state contracts and stuff, but we wanted to get an idea of, of what people were capable of doing along these lines. So, and uh, it helped us, eight vendors responded. Now, of course, in RFI, you won't ask for budget costs, so our budget estimates on this are still just uh, based on what the, the state contract would have, but that's not necessarily the software we'll end up with. So we're going right now on this. The RFP is expected to be released at the end of quarter one, FY20, so uh, this will be huge. Uh, if you're wondering what departments were involved in this, Animal Welfare, Embark, Finance, Fire, uh, Municipal or Mayor Council Offices, uh, Municipal Court, Parks and Rec, Personnel, of course, PIM was involved, planning, police, public works, utilities, and then the airports all had needs to use some function of this. So the goal is, of course, residents receive one communication from the city. And uh, PIM will tell you that the other goal of this is a resident can register for different things so they can only get communications that they're interested in. Hopefully, well, 620 square miles, I'm sure it's a challenge for, we've heard from residents saying, it's hard for me to tell what's happening in my area. So Hopefully with this, it won't just be, you just get everything. You can say, I, I want to only know stuff that's happening around me or within my ward or whatever. So definitely an improvement to help you guys communicate too. Uh, the permits, data analytics web app is funded. So we're actually trying to kick that off so we can get that going as quick as possible after July 1st when the funding's in place. So like I said, that'll let citizens or residents go in and, and actually query the permit system that they may be making uh, open record requests now. We are putting stuff out on dataokc.gov, but they still have to filter that. So this will let them go in and do their own queries against the permit system. Next, and that's it. Any questions? One question, uh, you mentioned under technology enhancement, the ele electronic plan review, uh -huh. kind of intrigued by that. When did it start and when will the rollout occur? So uh, we've talked about this with departments for years, I mean, many, many years, and, you know, technology evolves and things like that, and, and we've been on a cella, and so we knew, we've been on a cella for a long time, so we knew we wanted something that integrated with that. Well, I'll tell you that even with the cella, you know, there was a period of time where they were partnering with a vendor, and then they switched, and they were going to develop their own, so it's kind of an excuse to say that there wasn't stability within how this was gonna be done. We knew the back end system had to be a cella. The other side is, you know, just users within the city, you know, are so used to working on paper and things like that and couldn't imagine trying to review, you know, plans this big, how am I gonna do that on a computer screen? And so, you know, we weren't, we we're still working with them. With the environment, I'd say last fall we met with Public Works, we do strategic alignments, it was, yes, let's go, and then utilities almost in parallel is looking at the processes and they have a whole project going on to review this. So, 
you know, kind of the stars aligned and said, now's the time to do it. But I will tell you, we in IT worked with departments to get those processes, workflows in a sell us, and now it's just putting that electronic plan review piece on top. And I know within development services at the last Acela conference, there was new software out that was like, yeah, this is, you know, this is basically awesome. This will work. So everything's there. So now it's a, yeah, let's go. And we didn't pick that piece of software. There's two or three vendors capable of doing this, but you know, it, it, this will be big. And we've worked with those departments to make sure they request in their budget the funding for the hardware that they're going to need to make it. You know, the people actually doing a review, we don't want them to reject this because they're trying to look on a smart computer screen or, you know, maybe somebody wants to review the plans on, you, you know, some with a tablet or something. So making sure each user can review them how they want. But so hopefully we can go with that as quickly as possible. And like I said, it'll depend on the proposer will propose and then they'll give us time frames for implementation. Then we'll know. I think in a year, two years. I mean, I hope it wouldn't be more than a year, but we, we a lot of times get bogged down and it's hard to say when you get in the contracting and things like that, but we're going to push as, as much as we can because I know public works, utilities, development services are all anxious to get going on this. Yeah, we're, the RFP is basically drafted, so we're doing a review. I, within IT, we've had our, our project management team lead just retire, so we're having some, you know, so we're trying to manage their resources there. and. And so we've had to sign that project to another person and, and get her going on it. So, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Chad. So, next up we have LaShawn Thompson with Municipal Courts. Good morning, Mayor and Council. LaShawn Thompson, Court Administrator for Municipal Court. Um, today I'm here to present the FY20 proposed uh, budget for Municipal Court. But first I'd like to uh, introduce some of my staff that I brought with me today. I have Galen Keaton, Business Manager. I have John Lemieux, the Finance Service Manager. Melissa Meredith, the Court Service Manager. And Tanya Cubitt Womack, our Chief Probation Officer. And they're a great team and they contribute to the department's success. Our mission, our model in municipal court is that we believe that it's justice for all. I'd like to restate our mission statement. The mission, of, the, the mission of municipal court is to ensure procedural justice to our court patrons affected by a violation of Oklahoma City ordinances so they can be assured of fairness, transparency, impartiality, and the timely disposition of all cases. Uh, procedural justice seeks to ensure that the justice system treats everybody with dignity and respect. In the review of our current strategic business plan, we wanted to ensure that the department's mission statement is in line with the council's strategic policies to uphold our highest standards for city services, continue to ma maintain a strong financial management, and pursue our social and criminal justice initiatives. Our department, we have 67, 67 employees in the department. Four of those employees are, um, are municipal judges that are appointed by council. We have five lines of business in municipal court. In FY19, the department was responsible for processing a little over 137,000 citations. We also hold 70 uh, court sessions weekly in our court. Next is our proposed operating budget. Um, $8.8 .8 million is what our, our proposed budget is for this year. Next, I would like to discuss a need that we have identified in our proposed improvement uh, request. Currently, um, this slide represents our, um, our jail population, our inmate population in the county jail. As you can see, uh, we've had a high of 64 and we've had some lows of 37. And um, I'd like to continue to work on this. The inmate daily uh, population is monitored in our community outreach program. It's monitored daily to ensure that inmates are moving through the, the process, uh, releases are being done in a timely manner. Um, we've made some significant changes in this area. The department now has a dedicated community relations coordinator that monitors the daily bookings and releases, releases to ensure that our inmates are processed and released in a timely manner. 
This average could be reduced even more if we could focus on some of our high-risk offenders in the jail that continue to reoffend or fail to come to court after being granted an OR bond. This, the intensive daily monitoring of the jail bookings has assisted us with identifying the inmates that continue to drain our resources due to untreated mental health issues and substance abuse issues. I'm proposing to implement a day reporting program for inmates that are not eligible for a mandatory 10 or 24 hour OR bond. The program requests of $50,000 would be used to fund a day reporting program, which is similar to what's being used in Oklahoma County Court right now. Currently, Oklahoma County uses contracted vendors to provide a daily reporting services for their county inmates. The agency providing the service is responsible for completing an assessment to determine the inmate's eligibility in the program. The inmates are then released on a conditional bond and a court order to, partic to participate in treatment services as recommended by the agency. The agency is responsible for notifying the court of the defendant's compliance in the program, and this program will be managed underneath the community outreach program. The day reporting program will be responsible for providing treatment services while the defendant remains in the community instead of being incarcerated. Our goal is for the defendant to receive treatment services while successfully obtaining the skills, resources, and the tools need, needed to live a productive lifestyle, hopefully deterring further activity. In our court, it takes about typically three to six months to uh, dispose of a case. And while the defendants are enrolled in the day reporting program, they would be participating in services while they're in the community. This, set, this next slide looks at treatment services versus incarceration services. Um, the bar on the left, it shows that, uh, and according to the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services, this is their data, it costs $2,000 a year to treat a person in outpatient services. If you look at the second red bar, it shows that it costs $19,000 to treat a person that's in prison. And then that amount increases to $23,000 if the person is severe, severely men, uh, mentally ill. Currently, right now, we pay Oklahoma County $43.78 to house our inmates in the Oklahoma County Jail. By proposing this day reporting program, we could, uh, the program would approximately cost about $20 a day to treat the, to treat the inmate while they're in the community. Even though it's a cost savings to the jail contract, the reward of provi providing services, treatment services, to this population is moving the needle in the right direction. According to the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services, um, no, I'm sorry, according to the Uni United States Department of Justice, 24% of all jail inmates report symptoms that meet the criteria of a psychotic disorder. According to the National Alliance, um, on mental illness, one out of every three Oklahomans suffer from a mental health issue. Even though we're looking at a small population of inmates, if left untreated, those same individuals pose a high probability to continue to drain our resources and other resources in the state as well. We have made a substantial amount of progress with reducing the number of defendants that are incarcerated. However, I would like to decrease that amount even further by this program. Next, I would like to highlight a couple of our issues identified in our strategic business plan and our progress that we've made to achieve those goals. Procedural justice, issue number one, delivering fair justice. Courts across America are being tasked with the importance to carry out procedural justice and fairness in the process of the court. Research has shown that if courts are respectful, neutral, easy to understand and give people involved in the case a voice, they can build trust in, in the law. It is the trust which causes people to comply with court orders, to co cooperate with the police, and ultimately obey the law. We have contracted with the Center of Court Innovation, court, court Innovation to train all of our municipal court employees over the concept of uh, procedural justice. And now this training will be required for all of our staff, for all new employees. Sorry. Issue two, skilled workforce. The court remains committed to informing citizens of their options for handling their case in court. We provide our court staff with continuous training on customer service and providing accurate legal information. 
It's important that our court patrons are able to make an informed decision when handling their case in our court. In order to maintain this high level of customer service, we have enhanced our website and our brochures. Majority of all of our forms are now available in Spanish. We contract for certified court interpreters and other services for the hearing impaired. All of our inbound calls are monitored daily and 10% of those calls are reviewed daily for quality assurance, training, mentoring, and coaching. We utilize Metro Tech's downtown campus to assist our training needs, employee development, and customer service training. Continuous training is provided on criminal justice reform initiatives. Our next slide is our customer satisfaction survey slide, and this is something that I'm really proud of. Uh, we implemented this survey in January of 2017, and this graph represents our progress that we've made in the area of customer service. We know that people, when they come to municipal court, sometimes they uh, are not pleased with uh, coming to municipal court, so we try to make this a win-win situation when our customers come into our building. Um, this year, 84% of our people who have completed our survey have rated their experience as being satisfied. Now, they may not agree with the outcome, but they're satisfied in the, in the manner that we have handled their, uh, handled their case. And this graph uh, states that, and it's on a rating scale of a 1.5. The survey links are available, they're printed at the bottom of the receipts. We have comment cards throughout the building, and then also, um, you can find our survey available online. And we use our survey results to improve in training, and then also our employees are recognized for their outstanding customer service as well. Issue three, technology services. In this age of technology, there is a demand for more and more of our services to be available online. We now offer our court dockets online. You no longer have to call to find out when is your court date or an attorney. They can pull their dockets and their dockets are available. Uh, you can search records online now. We have wayfinding kiosks in our buildings and outside of each one of our courtrooms, we have court displays. So just in case you happen to lose your paperwork or you're not sure what courtroom you're supposed to be in, you can look for your name on the display and you'll know exactly which uh, courtroom that you're supposed to be in. And our new system, our new uh, uh, court system, has offered us the opportun opportunity to expand in our technology. We have identified a number of processes that we would like to offer online, and this grant—I mean, this graph—represents 30 percent, 36 percent of those functions are now available. Um, it's our goal to be able uh, to offer services for requests for driving school. Uh, requests for trial, insurance and driver's license verification, e-file services, submission of forms in a secure portal. So we're constantly identifying things that we can do to improve the, uh, the services that we offer online. Issue number four, our juvenile services resource. Our juvenile court was established in 1997 to, uh, it was designed for our first time offenders to give some relief off of Oklahoma County. And we deal with juveniles that are charged with misdemeanor offenses in our court. Juveniles are typically court ordered to participate in a six month supervised probation uh, plan. We partner with the Oklahoma City Police Department, uh, the school districts that are in our areas. And so some of the probation requirements include counseling, substance abuse treatment, random drug testing, community service, uh, conflict resolution program, referrals to uh, the juvenile intervention program underneath Oklahoma City Police Department and mandatory school attendance and, and compliance. This graph represents the success rate in this program. We're currently at 96% uh, a success rate in the program. Year to date, 1,409 juveniles have been played. We filed 1,400 cases in juvenile court. And of those cases, 928 juveniles were placed on probation. Seven, year to date, 790 of, those, 790 of those cases have completed their probation successfully. And that's what this chart represents. Programs. Next, I would like to highlight our programs. Um, one of our um, success stories is our community outreach program. This program was launched in community, uh, uh, 
launched in July of 20, uh, 2018, we added another position to this program. And it's just been really uh, instrumental in s assisting our defendants that are in their court. Their offices are housed on the first floor of the building. When you come into municipal court, you're able to ask questions before you uh, go into court. So you're, you're able to ask all those questions prior to entering into a courtroom and you get the most informed information about your case. If you want to call, you can call and speak with them. Another thing that they do, they partner with the Homeless Alliance, North Care, Remerge, uh, to name a few, City Rescue Mission Team, the Department of Corrections, uh, the Federal Bureau of Prison Prisons, and other uh, district courthouses. When inmates are in custody and are in different programs or different uh, facilities, they cannot maneuver in throughout the system if they have some outstanding obligations in a different court. This program is designed to help them with that. So they can write into this program. The program will work with the judges, the municipal counselor's office, to ensure that the, we can get these cases disposed. Also, it works with reentry programs to get people's license who have been suspended or revocated, uh, get those driver's license back. And then also, if you voluntarily come into court, you know, you won't go to jail in municipal court. This next slide represents the number of municipal cases that have been disposed of as a result of a written correspondence. In FY18, like I said, when we launched the program, 965 cases. We added one more position, we have doubled this program by 1,893 cases being disposed. Now, this is just written correspondence. By written correspondence, we still have a lot of foot traffic that comes in the building um, that, that uh, is not depicted on this graph. And then also, this program completed, has completed 13 community outreach events. By going into the community and letting people know, hey, if you have these outstanding issues in municipal court, this is what you need to do to, go, to, to handle it. So we um, have partner with the Latino agency, uh, just, different, just different agencies in the community to help uh, get the word out. Come in, take care of your obligations. You won't go to jail if you voluntarily come in and address those issues. Court Enforcement and Investigation Program. Um, we have the Oklahoma City Police Department Court Detail Unit. They provide the security and then also the issuance of the warrants um, from our court, and then we have our court officers which are responsible for providing them with all the information for a pickup order to, uh, to serve those, those warrants. You know, we do have people, no matter what we do, you still have to issue a warrant. Um, after all the things that we do, this is ultimately what ends up happening when someone doesn't comply with the, with the things that we have in place. This program manages the post-court reminder program in the event, let's say you forget to pay your traffic ticket, you have a 15-day grace period. In that 15-day grace period, you're sent a reminder notification, a phone call is made, hey, come in, take care of this matter. In the 15 days, the case does not increase to the penalty rate and no warrant is issued. So you're not penalized in the event that there was some oversight that you forgot to handle your, your court business. And we do send out the reminders. We believe that the reminder program has um, a 50% compliance rate. This next slide is the to total number of warrants issued and cleared. We've made several changes in our court processes, which requires a defendant, um, they get more time now in our court to pay their fines and costs. Like I said, we've implemented the 15-day grace period, and then defendants are no longer jailed because they don't have the ability to pay. If you're jailed, you're jailed because you missed a court hearing, not because you didn't have the money, okay? And um, even though fewer warrants are being issued, our compliance rate has remained the same and remained consistent since FY16. 49% 16, of our citations are paid within the first 60 days of issuance. And so even though we're issuing fewer warrants, we're still getting the compliance. our court financial processing program. This, process is, this program is responsible for um, handling uh, many of our out-of-court processes, please outside of the courtroom, collection of payments, and posting bonds. 
This next slide shows the number of court transactions that we process electronically. Um, process in, in person, process um, over the phone, and process by using a customer service rep or going online to make a payment. This next slide represents our court collection by our different sources. We have four main sources of collection. We collect a little over $21 million in FY18. Our fines, court costs, fees, and exterior maintenance fines makes up the total collections in municipal court. The next program is our court case support program. They are responsible, I refer to them as the brains of the of, of municipal court because they are the ones that uh, are scheduling our 70 dockets a week. They're assisting with our uh, 33 indigency hearings that we have uh, monthly. They handle about 650 telephone uh, calls daily, our open requests, our docket counter, parking program, and they provide the court clerk services. So they keep the, they keep the shop moving in municipal court. This graph represents our performance in a court case program, court case support program. It's important that cases are updated in a timely manner to ensure that warrants are not being issued in error. And this shows our accuracy rate. Uh, we audit 20% of our cases daily to ensure that our court clerks are updating the cases like they're supposed to. And currently, right now, we're at a 99% accuracy rate. Our successful outcomes. Um, we have a lot of things to be a proud of in municipal court. We have just currently deployed 25 additional e-citation devices uh, to the Oklahoma City Police Department. Uh, our e-cite devices, e-citation devices are allowing us to move from paper citations to electronic citations. If you're issued a paper citation, it takes anywhere from three to five days to get the uh, ticket on the computer. When you issue it from an e-citation device, the ticket immediately goes into municipal court and we can start the processing of the citation. We've done some amazing work in the area of criminal justice reform and however, none of this would be possible without the support of mayor and council. Uh, we continue to remain on the cutting edge and we have been nationally recognized uh, by the Vera Institute and many other agencies for our reform efforts. With the guidance and assist assistance from our presiding judge, Philippa James, Deputy Municipal Counselor Cindy Richard, and uh, retired Chief Police Chief Bill City and his staff, we have worked jointly to identify and improve our processes, decrease our daily inmate population, and improve our jail bookings and release pro process. Our collaboration has been the cornerstone of our success. We have transformed municipal court, much like Oklahoma City has been transformed in the past 20 years. I remain dedicated to improving the processes in our court, and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. The community outreach program that's been so successful, I know we added a, a second position to help Manny. Mm -hmm. um, two enough? Need more? Right now, um, we are in the set first year of that second position. And with the launching of the day reporting program, um, it would be safe to say let's look at it for a, a year and just see um, if the day, day reporting program will increase those numbers and increase the activity. But yes, right now, two, two uh, liaisons are plenty right now. Mm -hmm. uh First, I'd like to applaud you all for the work that you all are putting in place right now and moving forward. It's so critical. Um, before I say what I want to say, okay. I, I would like to ask, what would you say are our biggest opportunities here um, to continue to lower the incarceration rate here in the metro area? What, what are our opportunities? Like, if you could say, maybe it's one to three, I don't know, but what are the main things we can be doing? Um, we are definitely lowering our MA population now. Um, we could, the day reporting program, because currently right now, if you're jailed on a municipal offense, you are automatically granted a 10 or 24 hour OR bond if, they, if, if you don't have a warrant, okay? So I think one thing that we could focus on is getting compliance of those defendants that refuse to come back to court, 
because the only time that you are housed in the county jail is that you're on a warrant and refusing to come back to court. And so that's the population that we need to work on. Um, they are released on an OR bond, they don't come back to court, and so then when they're picked up, they're not eligible for another OR bond. It's getting them to be compliant with the court order and returning back to court. What would you say is preventing those folk from being in compliance, like why not return? What would you, I mean, what are you all seeing in your I, I would say a big population is uh, individuals with mental health issues and substance yeah. abuse issues. Right. And, and if we could get those individuals the treatment that they need, then maybe we could get them to comply with, with, court, with the court order and returning to come back to court. You know, not, not only are they draining our resources, but they're draining OCPD and the other you know, uh, services that we have in the area as well. So I, I just think that if we could get them the service that they need. And then I was really devastated hearing you say one in three Oklahomans have a mental health concern. Mm -hmm. And then I was just looking up, you know, a few years ago we were number two in the nation mm -hmm. with mental health. And one of the things that they said, was Terry White here, was that I think a lot of people forget that the brain, I'm quoting now, the brain is simply another organ in the body. When you're in a very unhealthy state, when your population is unhealthy and has high rates of diseases, you're, of course, going to have high rates of brain diseases as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. And somewhere along the way, we forgot that. Or not even forgot, I don't know. Um, just real briefly, as you were talking, I, I think sometimes people label certain types of people as bad or certain parts of area as bad mm -hmm. and criminals and that there can be no restoration in this way. Mm -hmm. But the movie Scream has been in my head listening mm -hmm. to you. Just real quick on this, just real quick. Um, in that film, the killers say that they are, well, I won't spoil who it is. For those of you who haven't seen it, it's a mystery. It's a mystery. <laughs> but the killers say that their stated reason for why they're doing what they're doing, they live in the suburbs, they don't live in the city, they live in the nice farm, sprawling suburbs of this, uh, this city. And the killers say, oh, we're doing it because the movies taught us how to be killers, the exorcists and stuff like that. So we're just going to recreate this. But by the end of the movie, you realize that is not why they're doing it. Mm -hmm. They're doing it because one of the killers, their home is broken. The father has had an affair. Mm -hmm. The mother has left town. Or as this killer says, abandoned him. And this abandonment has caused him to go, sorry, this killer to go on a killing spree. Mm -hmm. And the movie concludes with the reporter saying that far out here in the suburbs where we thought everything would be safe and where its residents have fled the crime-ridden inner cities, all of a sudden we find that this is going on. And you know, every one of these mass shootings, almost every single one of them tend to be in these idyllic settings where people are like, we're shocked that it's happening out here too. I'm not when I hear statistics like one out of every three Oklahomans, mm -hmm. not Oklahoma Cityans. Oklahomans, and I think we would do better to keep putting these new st these statistics in our head. And whatever I can do as a council person to help you all um, with the courts um, and with the rest of the city to address mental health, and not just for the jail, but our kids. I, one of the other things that Terry White said is if we can do screenings in our schools, which I think is something we're starting to move toward, but these ACE scores, these ACE education, like adverse childhood, uh, what's going on? Like what's going on in their neighborhoods? What happens when a kid is hearing constantly gunshots? What happens when a kid is hearing mom and dad fight all the time? What happens when the kid is facing bullying for being LGBT or having a disability or the color of their skin or their religion or whatever it is? And what does that do to their brain and how does it shape them as an adult and the choices they make? And we've got to start talking more like this. And I'm guessing you all know this because you all have been putting work in place to address this. But I want to start speaking to this from the council going forward that there are not bad people. There are people who were shaped by their environment and by chemicals in their brains. And I'm really, really tired of not addressing this. And being a middle school teacher on the south side where for four years I heard sometimes even other teachers call my students discipline problems, or it must just be their culture. Like, that's not cool. It's not their cultures, it's their brains. And it's the environments we've shaped for them. And I just see this wonderful opportunity to reshape their environments for them going.
report. So I really appreciate the data you've provided here, and I'm going to do everything I can to work with you, and I suspect so will the rest of the council. So thank you so much for the work you all are doing. Really appreciate you. Thank you, Councilman. I just want to echo that as well, um, and I want to thank you all for being community-minded when it comes to uh, the procedural justice uh, that you offer for the city of Oklahoma City. And I know um, Councilman Stone and myself have been a part of the juvenile uh, intervention program, and to that success, uh, you know, these are obviously great ways to prevent recidivism for our young people. It gives them that, that set second chance, a brand new start. And I just want to commend you all for those efforts. And I know uh, we're talking budget, but um, the, just those types of things are even part of the budget because you don't, we don't want that recidivism. We don't want uh, those return fines or fees or, or just incarceration in itself. So I also want to commend you all uh, for the great work that you're doing uh, when it comes to the community and keeping the community in mind uh, when it comes to procedural justice because it can be very intimidating when you get a ticket or just any kind of warrant or, and you all are able to walk people through that process to make it less intimidating. So thank you for your efforts. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next up is Bob Tainer, our Director of Development Services Department. Good morning. I'm going to do a brief run through on the Development Services uh, Department's budget, proposed budget. I'm going to introduce Rick Wickenkamp. He's the Assistant Director. He put this together, so if you have questions, I'll refer to him. No. And Cindy Lake, and you see her, her every Tuesday. She's with the Zoning Subdivision. I want to read the uh, mission statement. The mission of the Department uh, of the Development Services Department is to provide animal welfare code enforcement, construction permitting and inspections, licensing and development application review services to the development community and general public so they can receive timely development decisions and live in a clean, safe, and stable city. We have five lines of business. These are the, the four main. Development center, that's our building permit uh, area, code enforcement, subdivision and zoning, and animal welfare. Uh, this year we're adding five new positions in animal welfare. Total number of staff will be 197 in this budget. The, the total operating budget for the department is just under $19.9 million, $19 million. That's up 3.43% from last year. Uh, our major budget changes, and I really point out the the middle one there, we're adding, we've added four animal welfare officers and a supervisor. Um, what this has done for us, it, it gives us the ability to, we'll have nine field officers, nine, nine field officers. Uh, currently, we, uh, our field officers are in the field till five o'clock. With this, this addition, that will extend our time to 9 o'clock, and it will overlap during our peak times, which is between 3 and 5 in the afternoon. It's really when the kids are getting from home from school and the parents are getting home from work. So we'll have, hopefully, better coverage there. And then anything after 9 o'clock, we have on-call officers that, you know, if there's an issue with the police department or something, they can call them in. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the development center. This is our largest division. We have 85 uh, employees. Um, in the year in FY8, in the physical year 18, we had we completed over 105 inspections, um, issued 54,000 permits. Um, the last bullet there, we do over 25 percent of the city's uh, open records requests. And the discussion during the IT budget. We're doing some things to try to address that because that really takes a lot of our time and uh, we need to figure out a way to address those things. This is uh, projected construction inspections. Uh, we're on pace to do almost 110,000 inspections this year. We have 40 trade uh, officers that your building, mechanical, which is heat and air, plumbing and electrical. Um, this is about a 5.6% in projected increase over last year. 
Um, and something that's kind of interesting to me is 73% of our new construction in Oklahoma City is residential. And 75% of this 110,000 inspections are residential inspections. So clearly our residential development is, is going well. Um, this next slide, this talks about our, uh, this is one of our goals, to do our constructions of those 110,000 uh, inspections, to try to do those inspections in one day, completed within one day, 92% of the time. And this is a result of a 2013 audit they did about our uh, ability to do in, uh, construction inspections. Um, I think it's important to note here that, you know, every department goes through, uh, people are out vacant, retirements, those types of things. We've been able to maintain right around 90% on these, on these inspections. And uh, I know that the contractors and the developers appreciate it because that helps them get their, their work done timely. And I really need to add here too that one of the, one of the things the staff does is we meet with the trade uh, groups. Uh, our development center manager and our chiefs, they, be, they meet twice a year with the, the, the electrical contractors, the building contractors. Uh, we meet annually with the home builders, which do most of our residential buildings. And that allows us to, do, you know, to, to interact with them and talk about changes in inspections or changes in the code. And uh, just recently, Councilman Stone Cipher and Stone facilitated a meeting with the uh, Associated Building and uh, Building Contractors Association. We, I think we have a meeting scheduled with, with them in June. Uh, and that's just another opportunity for us to meet, talk about, answer questions if they have concerns about you know, inspections, the way we do inspections. But, you know, it's also an outreach from this group that we, we really want our customer to be involved in the process. I'm going to talk about code enforcement briefly. We have 45 uh, staff members in this division. Uh, they complete over 100,000 inspections a year. Uh, they do unsecured and dilapidated. Uh, that's what you guys see every Tuesday. Uh, they do junk and debris, uh, high grass and weeds. We're going to have a we're going to have a big high grass and weed season this year because of all the rain. Um, we do property maintenance, and that last bullet there, we've we've removed over sixty two thousand illegal signs last year. And uh, I mean, we, that's just one of the things that uh, we really need to try to address. We have four part time employees that that's all they're dedicated to are illegal sign removal. Again, as, as I say every year, thank you for not choosing a picture that had one of our signs in it. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to note as well that when I ran for office, I did not put a single yard sign in the public right of ways as per the letters I received from the city clerk's office. Thank you for what you do. Well, that was actually the sixth choice. So <laughs> it took us a while to get there, but we found it. And we had to back out from on the picture a little bit, but, but we managed to pull that off. Um, this is our, our one, uh, our promoting safe and secure neighbor and thriving neighborhood slide. I didn't get to make that presentation this year, but this is an, I mean, this is a good reflection of our, our code enforcement. Uh, we try to work with property owners to make sure that they can comply on their own so we don't have to go through the process of either abating or writing a citation. Uh, the trend is up. We're up. Just we're up to 81 percent, or projected to hit 81 percent this year. Um, I mean, in in our mind, it's important if the if the neighbors will do will invest in their properties and fix those, so we don't you know we don't have to do it. These next slides, I'm going to just show you some before and afters. These are property maintenance uh, issues that we work with the property owners, and and they've been able to you know change it from that. You know, I'm, I know a neighbor. You know, the neighbor to the right there much prefers this than what was uh, there before. And this is one that they, a property owner started construction and then stopped, and we were receiving complaints because it's really an attractive nuisance for people. So we worked with them, and, and they've almost completed the, uh, the new structure, which it looks, oh, not new, but re, re bricking the structure. It looks a lot better. And this next one, uh, that entire front porch was dilapidated and needed to be 
we were going to have to remove it because it wasn't safe. But working with the property owner, they were able to tear that down and, and do some new siding, and they're, they're still waiting to do a new front porch there. But that looks a lot better than, you know, what was there before. So I think that, I mean, that's a program I think really helps the neighborhood. It gets our inspectors in there working with the property owners, and we've had some successes. I want to talk about subdivision and zoning. This is our smallest division. Um, they processed over 449 zoning applications last year. Uh, you know, you see the zoning applications every Tuesday. They're the staff that, that reviews the PUDs, the SPUDs, special permits, all those, and, and prepares the report. Uh, they also support the Planning Commission and the Board of Adjustment. this next slide uh, we do a couple of different measurements for the for this division uh, over the last three years we've been able to get uh, an applicant a planning uh, preliminary plat decision within 60 days um, a preliminary plats the first development layout of a new subdivision and uh, what we've thought about since we we've, we've hit this target three years in a row now that maybe we'll look to condense that maybe to 45 days to see if you know we can uh, make it more efficient uh, part of our part of the issue here is that we have statutory notice requirements that we have to meet so there's are some limitations but you know if there's any way we can make it better we're going to look at that this next one's the um, animal welfare uh, you know, you probably know um, we get over 8,000 visitors a year to the shelter, which if you add that up, it's almost 100,000 people go through our facility every year. And uh, I know that the new council, uh, they're going to go visit on, in June. To, I, I think you'll be, you'll be happy and then you'll be sad when you see the animals. So it, it'll, be, uh, it'll, it'll be interesting for you. Uh, we complete over 13,000 calls a year um, we did not over just over 9500 uh, sterilization spades and neuters we have a community spade program where if you're a, a citizen of Oklahoma City you can get your animals spayed or neutered for free you just have to sign up uh, I mean that's been a very uh, I think it's been a very big part of how we uh, this next slide I'm going to talk about our live release rate I think that's, that community program has really helped us uh, make this goal. Uh, our goal for FY19 is 90% live release rate. Uh, we're at 86 now. Uh, a lot of this, I mean, we couldn't make that without our partners. Uh, go back, Cindy. I just want to talk briefly about some of the things, the community spade and neuter program, the community cat program. Uh, you know, it's, you know, without the council support and the manager's office support, we would never have been able to, to do this. Uh, we work with um, the Central Oklahoma, Oklahoma Humane Society. They're one of our partners. Uh, we have several uh, national partners that, that uh, provide training to our staff. I just want to give you some statistics on the animals that come through our facility. 13% um, of the animals that come into our, our facility are returned to the owner. 43% of the animals that come through are adopted out by the facility. And then the remaining 44% are processed through our partners, where they go out to OK Humane and they d adopt them out or we do some other transfer out. So uh, we're working hard to, to you know, get it, get it to 90%. So uh, this next slide I need to talk about real quick is our, da our dangerous animal caseload. We do, like I said, we do over 13,000. We receive over 13,000 calls a year. About, we average about 90 a year of dangerous calls, dangerous dog calls. And a dangerous dog, a dangerous animal is an unprovoked animal that attacks or attempts to attack person, a person or another animal. So we think that our additional field officers will give us a better response time on some of these calls. Uh, 
in the summer of 17, we had, the council adopted a menacing dog ordinance that allows us to uh, spade and neuter any animal that comes in that's not a registered purebred, and it also allows us to chip the animal. That gives us the, uh, the ability to track. You know, if we have a, an animal and, and we, we have release it back to the owner, we know where it is, and so if there's a pattern, we can, we can respond. Uh, I mean, I think that there's been studies that show that an animal that's been spayed or neutered, neutered is less aggressive and less likely to attack. And so uh, that community spayed and neuter program and that menacing dog ordinance has really helped us in those areas. And this next slide, these are some of the things we're looking to do in the future uh, this next year. We're going to improve, increase our online permitting. We've done uh, residential, let's see there, we do the residential mechanical and plumbing permits where you can do that online without having to call or come down. We're going to add insulation inspections. Uh, anything we can do to keep you from having to call and wait on the phone or come down, you know, we're, we're trying to improve in that area. A lot of it, we need help from IT and they've been really responsive. Uh, business license automation. Currently, we have 160 different business licenses in Oklahoma City that we have to issue. Uh, we're working with a vendor. We're going to condense those 168 down to nine different groups and put it all, try to put it as much of that online as we can. So when you're a business operator and you want a permit, you can just do it all online. Uh, and that's going to be, that's going to help us, I think. Uh, I won't talk much about the electronic plan review because th they talked about that, but that's something we're really looking forward to because we, if you, I know when Craig went on the tour of the uh, development center, there's large rolls of plans everywhere. And if we can figure out a way to get, get rid of those paper plans and get it all electronically, it, it really improve our abilities to, to process it. And these last three, these are, these are issues that were Alive in the 405, that's a partnership with the Oklahoma Humane that we're trying to get the word out to try to hit the 90% on our live release rate. Best Friends Network, that's one of the national networks that they provide training and best practices in the industry that helps us try to achieve that 90%. We do clear the shelter events where we try to take every adoptable animal and, and adopt it out in one day. And we've had four or five of those. And, those are some of the things that we've, we've learned from other shelters. And then the watershed fund, this is a $500,000 grant. Uh, it came through council a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's going to allow us to hire three part-time employees. What we found is that the animals in the shelter, the large, medium to large size dogs, that's the only group that, that the live release rate is lower than 90%. And so these new employees, uh, a lot of a large dog, people, people get in and they, they get concerned because they'll jump or they'll bark. Or, so what the program will do, it, we'll spend more time with those animals. We'll walk them on a leash, try to make them more comfortable. Hopefully that will help us uh, improve our uh, live release rate in that category. So with that, I'll answer any questions. I got one. Um, back on the, the live release uh, bar graph, um, that's, that's good that that, that is, that's going up. Another number that I'm curious about is the number of stray cats brought in. Uh, is that going down? Because I know whenever we talked about the community cats program, uh, this was kind of the main goal, but I, I know that uh, another goal was that that it's a little bit counterintuitive, at least in my head, that um, br taking cats back out to the community is going to reduce the amount of cats that are brought into the shelter. And so do we see any evidence of that happening? Well, I, I really need to give you the exact numbers. I'll have to talk to John. But yeah. uh, I mean, when we bring them, when we get them in, they're spayed and neutered by the community, or neutered by the uh, Oklahoma Humane and then put back out in the field. And the, and the program is that if there's a, an altered cat in that program, then another one won't come in, so the, it reduces the number of litters. Right. Yep. But I'll talk, to, I'll talk to John, we'll get you a number on that. Okay, cool, thanks. 
Will we have, what, what do you see as our needs going forward? I'm really excited about these new workers uh, being brought on um, to work with you all. I can just say that when I was meeting in neighborhood uh, association settings, uh, very frequently I would hear concerns about uh, loose dogs or the stray cats, but mostly the loose dogs in terms of, um, you know, just people trying to go on walks either by themselves or with their kids, and they're worried about this, you know, the dangerous animal in this sort of way. So I'm wondering what, can, what, going forward, what would you say our priority should be in addition to what you've already set in motion? Well, I, I think our, our biggest key here is to educate the owners. I mean, because it, the animals are, aren't in our shelter, most of the animals aren't in the shelter because of their own issues. It's because the owner didn't take care to keep them confined. And we need, and John does a lot of outreach to the neighborhoods and he goes to the schools, but I think probably an enhanced outreach to the neighborhoods to, to teach people how to own a dog and how to take care of a dog and not, you know, not let it get loose. I mean, we wouldn't, you know, if we could, if people would take care of their animals, we wouldn't have to deal with them. And our ability to get that message across is probably the most, one of the most important things. I'm glad you mentioned this education component. I'm sure it might make some people a little uncomfortable what I'm about to say, but forgive me. <clears throat> some of those, some of our, across the whole country, um, if someone has been raised to believe that an animal is truly less than and doesn't experience life in any way, shape, or form the way that we humans do, then it's easier to treat them as an object. And when they're an object, it's easier to do harm. In fact, when we see psychopaths in research, what is the very first thing that they harm before they harm a human being but an animal? It's a stepping stone. And so I think an education outreach would be, I don't know exactly what it would look like. I think you're right, it starts in the neighborhoods. And, but if we could figure out a way to talk to people and help them understand that that creature is experiencing life, it might not be at the same you know, brain capacity as we humans are, but they are walking through this world and experiencing and thusly also experience pain, and also experience trauma. And when they experience trauma, I have learned, that is what creates the quote, bad dog, right? The dog that acts out. Um, so I, I mean, I think this is, like I said, I think it might make people uncomfortable because now all of a sudden we have to rethink, oh, these are our neighbors also. <laughs> um, but that's not an uncomfortable thing for me to understand at all. And so anything I can do to help with that education outreach, please let me know. Yeah, I, and I think that's important in the schools, too, to try to, to teach kids early that you need to take care of your, your pets. And uh, I'll try to work in a movie reference at my next presentation. <laughs> I have Milo and Otis. I don't know. What do we <laughs> um, I had a question. Um, or maybe, yeah, more... As far as community and with the education piece, do, is there someone that's dedicated to going out into community and doing that education piece and, and asking and recruiting volunteers when it comes to the animal shelter? Yeah, last year in the budget, we added a line of business for community outreach. So we do have a program in the, in the shelter that does that. We do adoption events. We'll go to schools on request. Uh, and I mean, that's probably an area we need to strengthen. It, we've just really been doing it for a year now. But yeah, we do have a program now that, that reaches out to volunteers. And I didn't say that on that one si slide. We had 470 volunteers. Uh, you know, we couldn't do our job without the volunteers. The, I think our numbers were over 100,000 volunteer hours last year. And so, you know, that program reaching out to people that are willing to volunteer and finding ways to get the message out. Those are both important. And we do, John does, we do uh, uh, an article in the paper once a week. We do radio shows and a television show occasionally to try to get the message out. But there's, there's bound to be more thing, more outreach that we can do to get the word out. I think it's really impressive too to see that the improvement, I tell the story anytime we talk about performance management and improvements that can be made is that improvements have been made in the shelter and going to the live exit rate we have now has really been done primarily with the creative use of resources for their staff, their outreach with their partners, getting volunteers, 
community education and outreach. They've really done this without significant increases in resources within the shelter itself, and it's really an impressive change, you know, just within the culture of the community. Thank you. All right, thanks, Bob. Next up is Eric Winger with uh, Public Works. <clears throat> Well, thank you, Mayor and Council, as I get ready to present. Um, just a lot of appreciation. I think, as you know, there's a lot of players in the department that help us put together these budgets. And uh, Assistant Director Debbie Miller is here today. Um, Joanna McSpadden is also very instrumental as our business manager in assembling our, our PowerPoint. And uh, Shannon Cox, who does our public outreach, who's here. Um, our division heads are very involved. We have several changes that I'll present to you today and some things that we're going to enhance services throughout the Public Works Department. So as we proceed, um, this is the Public Works Department mission, um, providing infrastructure construction and maintenance, private construction review and inspection, and emergency first response services to live, work, and play in a safe environment for Oklahoma City. So similar to other department missions, um, you know, it is for our, our residents, and so as we proceed, um, we've got a number of uh, staff that assist in this. Um, this is an infographic that really breaks down our department by our numbers, and so we're the fourth largest department um, in the city of Oklahoma City. Um, you'll see that our largest division is in our streets division with 242 staff. So as we continue to prioritize on our city streets and city street drainage and traffic maintenance, that is our largest division. Our smallest division is our traffic division um, with 15, but you'll see the numbers for our other um, staff as well. This next graphic is really just that reminder of the level of service that we provide um, out into the community. Um, and I think it's just a friendly reminder that we've got a lot of infrastructure that's in our over 600 square miles of Oklahoma City. There's over 70,000 traffic control signs. There's over 12,405 traffic signals that are at 733 signalized intersections. We talk about the number of lane miles in Oklahoma City, and we've gone to centerline miles, but we have over, almost 3,600 centerline miles of roadway in our network, um, 53 miles of drainage channel, and of those road network miles, we actually treat about 1,500 of those miles as a part of our snow routes regularly every winter. We're broken into seven divisions. Um, you'll see those here, beginning with administration, engineering, field services, project management, stormwater, streets, and traffic management. And then this is what our budget looks like this year proposed in a, in a format that compares us to last year. So if you look at the first two columns, you're going to find that this is the current or this last fiscal year, fiscal year 19 budget. In the uh, third and fourth columns, you're going to see the proposed budget, and then you'll see the budget change on the far right. And so when we look at total operating expenditures, we're going to be proposing an increase from 529 to 53.3 million for operating. This will be a net nine additional staff going from 409 to 418. But you'll see the departmental total budget is going to increase from 244 million to 307 million. And this predominantly has to do with the inclusion of additional Better Streets, Safer City programs, the program that we began last year. It also incorporates traffic impact fees, which are coming online. So the, the large gain that you see in the non-operating, or if you look in the capital expenses, is due to the increase in those two programs. Some of our major budget changes are around project management, our maintenance specifically of streets, and then reporting and response back to our citizens. And so as I kind of outline most of the presentation, you see that we're going to be talking about the project management necessary for the increased number of projects, um, the improving of pothole response times in our street maintenance, and then we're continuing to receive a lot of additional input through either the Action Center or through the department directly just from, from citizens and interested parties just on information, and so we're looking to enhance that as well as a reporting and response. The total budget is $307 million. You'll find that here on this chart, and I think the point that we're making here is that if you look at the largest percentage of the Public Works budget is in the streets traffic and drainage maintenance at 90% of that total. So $234 million um, of the budget is, is primarily geared to streets. 207 of that specifically is for better streets, safer city. $21 million is for impact fees. And then there's $27 million of that portion that is in drainage. The remaining you see on that total also include the stormwater quality, 
the project management, field services, engineering, and the other divisions of public works. But this is just that emphasis that 90% of the public works budget is in fact going towards the streets component of Oklahoma City. We look at the operating budget and this will go towards more of the staffing levels. You're going to again see that the streets traffic and drainage maintenance makes up the majority of the department's expenses. Um, and so this will be those employees on um, the staffing levels at 50% or 26.5 million of that $53 million operating budget. And again, you'll see the other divisions also included um, at their rates, including the stormwater project management, field service and remaining divisions. These next series of slides is really just to bring up to speed um, each of the divisions, um, what's included in those divisions and some of those divisional changes. The first one is going to be engineering. Um, what we find in the engineering division um, is it's staffed by 27 positions at a budget of $4.4 million. They predominantly do drainage engineering, technical review, and paving. Um, we are increasing um, some of the staffing with a civil engineer five that's being added to increase the service level of the additional projects for project management technical reviews for private plan reviews and the assistance that we provide both the public and, and private construction. In drainage engineering, we're adding an additional engineer um, just to enhance the drainage program further, to be more responsive to drainage complaints and a lot of the drainage reviews that are needed citywide. Um, in technical review, whereas where predominantly a lot of our plan reviews occur, we're also increasing staff in that level. This has to do with a lot of new applications that are coming into public works regarding fiber optics, small cell, and even a lot of additional event permits that we're just starting to see citywide that require a level review, increasing those services as well. Field services is our next division. 50 positions, a budget of $4.5 million is proposed. Predominantly, this group is those that are doing those inspections in the right-of-way. So when there's new streets, new sidewalks, new trails, water lines, sewer lines, all those public construction projects are inspected um, by this division. Um, we average about $50 million in value a month of inspections. Um, that equates to about six to 700 inspections per month. Um, and then we actually do almost 2,600 reports a month that follow those individual inspections. Project management um, is next largest division. And of course, this is the group, um, 32 positions, $3.8 million that helps oversee not only better streets that I've mentioned, but also our bond issue program. So looking at project management, we are looking to add an additional senior project manager. Um, this is, again, to address the number of increasing projects and to increase that service level that we are putting out there to make sure that we have effective project management. I have a slide in just a moment. I'll show you that we're starting to increase the number of construction projects, and so the additional resources are necessary to make sure that we maintain our levels of service. Better Streets also continues to grow and develop. This will be that second full year of the Better Streets program, and so the number of construction projects is ever increasing. Um, but again, we're ready to staff and support those needs. This is the out output, um, part of our strategic business plan for the value of projects awarded. And you'll see some of the previous year's history looking back to 2016, 2017. Those were years without our Better Street Safer City program, predominantly our bond program, and would generally average between 90 and $100 million a year of output. But you'll see that the bar is now stacked beginning in 2018. So you'll see two different colors. You'll see a purple bar stacked on top of the blue. That is the addition of the Better Streets program, which started a little bit a year and a half ago. So we're in full stride this year in calendar year 19 with an additional 65 million in addition to the bond issue. So significant gains. Um, again, reminder, the bond issue is nearly a billion dollars at $967 million worth of projects. The sales tax for the Better Streets program is at $240 million. I mean, this is just really a representation of the amount of work that's coming out of Oklahoma City and supported by the department. Looking at stormwater quality, um, this is environmental water quality, household hazardous waste, public outreach, and industrial permitting. There's 29 positions, $3.5 million. And again, this, uh, this is a number of services that uh, include watershed um, inspections and reviews, making sure that we keep um, our streams and our river clean, um, but there's also a, a public outreach program that I'll, I'll address here in just the next few slides. One of the things that's important um, is obviously as we mitigate waste and, and illegal dumping is uh, the use of the household hazardous waste facility. This is the special collection event that we actually just had here on April 6th. And just to report, we had over 402 participants. It's not the best of weather days, but I would say that that was a great turnout. Um, we collected nearly 1,000 pounds of, of ammunition, 
300 pounds of non-used medication, um, 11,000 pounds of computers and computer parts, and over 168,000 pounds of tires. And these are things that did not have to go to the landfill that we're able to collect and help recycle. So this is an event that we have annually, um, and so we pulled in nearly 180,000 pounds of, of waste um, as part of just this special collection event. This is the Household Hazardous Waste Facility, and for those that may not be as familiar, it's at 1621 South Portland. It's open to the public Tuesday through Saturday, so we do have a weekend day that it's open. But this is where you can take a lot of those household hazardous waste like oil, um, unused household chemicals, um, anything that, uh, that can, again, stay out of the, the waste stream of going directly to the landfill. Um, you'll see that this is here. We have staff. You simply drive your vehicle into the facility. They completely unload it for you. Um, you can uh, take your utility bill. Um, city employees can also take a city ID and can do deposits there. But we also have partnering with um, other cities, MLUs with Edmond, The Village, Yukon, Shawnee, Moore, El Reno, War Acres, and Bethany that also participate with our facility. Last year, we collected over 657,000 pounds of waste just through the facility and kept that out of the landfills. And this is Wayne Drop. Wayne Drop is our part of our community outreach for our pre-K through sixth grade. We reach out to about 3,000 students each year. And again, it's protecting our water resources. And so it's an environmental program that our division puts on. Um, and again, we are in schools actually wrapping those up this spring as school's nearing an end. Um, but uh, we continue to do workshops. We also do the school site visits. We publish a newsletter. And then we're very active on social media promoting um, a green environment for Oklahoma City. Moving to streets, traffic, drainage, maintenance, and as I mentioned, this is the largest of the divisions in public works. 242 positions, budget of $26.5 million, and again, it's focused on drainage, streets, and traffic maintenance. The condition of city streets continues to be something of a focus for us as we also address the citizen surveys each year, which have targeted and the reason, of course, for our bond issues and our Better Streets program. But I'm happy to report that our payment condition ratings continue to increase. Um, this year, we're currently at a 67. Um, this is up from 1213 from a 62. So the bond issue's done quite a bit in getting that increased. But one of the th items that we're targeting now with Better Streets is that we may see a two or three point increase here in this next year. And so we have set a target of 70. Um, which was an earlier goal without better streets that we thought would take a number of additional years. But we feel very confident that in this next year that this target of 70 is very possible um, as we continue to just resurface streets citywide. And this is residential and arterial. Um, we are also looking to do a number of some additional items um, for condition of streets. Next slide. With uh, utility cut repairs, pothole patching, and roll road maintenance. And so in addition to the resurfacing projects, um, these projects are extremely important. Utility cut repairs, I might remind, is something that we've actually made a change in this last year. We work very closely with the utilities department. When a water line um, takes out a section of city street, we used to contract that work, and it could take as many as 30 to 45 days to make those repairs. We found that as a concern, obviously closing traffic and not being able to get those repairs completed as timely as we would like. That has moved to public works, and under the utility cut repair program, we're actually able to affect and have cut that time in about half on the time that that street is shut down. So that was one positive change for improving city streets on a much more quick and rapid basis. It's pothole repair and rural road maintenance. These are just examples of those slides. Um, fortunately, we still fill, um, on average, around 80,000 potholes a year. We're on the mark this year for about 60,000. It's completely dependent upon the rain. Obviously, with the increased drains, we've had a lot of increased number of potholes the past several weeks, so crews remain extremely busy. Um, but we do a lot of roll road maintenance as well. So not every street is a paved street. Not every street has drainage structures that are underground, and so our crews work very diligently um, to make sure that we're keeping the streets safe. Um, I just remind those that have a pothole concern, obviously, with a lot of the weather, to please contact our city's action center. 297-2535, that helps us get those reports directly to our crews and gets them out as quickly as possible. Our goal is to have those filled within three days, but we appreciate the extra patience with just the huge numbers that have come in in just the last couple of weeks. So our strategic result, and we are struggling, um, is to complete 80% of pothole repairs within three days. And you'll see that we've really had a ride on this number. It's gone up and down, and we've made changes. One of the strategic changes that we're looking at this year and there is an increase in number of positions as we're looking to go to quadrant-based um, reporting and quadrant-based pothole repairs. So 
What happens now is as those reports come in through the Action Center, we're really filling those potholes as they're received. With a quadrant-based system, it's going to allow our crews to stay focused in specific areas, not only just to receive those reports, but also do some proactive pothole filling. So as a crew is, is driving a specific area, they can actually self-report to make those pothole repairs, hopefully increasing that time. So we expect significant improvements in our response time this coming year and with the additional staff that are proposed as a part of this budget. We also do signal replacement and striping. This is just an example of some of those machines and equipment and some of the staff that do those. Uh, this includes a lot of the signage maintenance, the signal maintenance, and this is just an example of the long line striping machine. There's a number of projects that public works crews do resurfacing on, but we also do our own striping on those. We're predominantly located in most of the rural areas where our construction contracting groups are actually more in our urbanized areas. Final division I'm going to update um, this morning is our traffic management division. 15 positions, it is our smallest at $1.6 million. And this is traffic engineering and some of their primary services include, of course, the Traffic and Transportation Commission. Um, they also look at a lot of plan reviews. They also oversee the intelligent traffic control system. And they've also been very busy this past year with the integration of the streetcar project into the downtown traffic system. So a number of projects underway. They also oversee work zones. They help review special event permits, just making sure that we keep streets open and as safe as possible for our, for our residents. So as we look at the outlook, and this is my final slide for you this morning, um, we're on a target this year to have at least 60,000 potholes repaired. And if it continues to rain, that number will likely increase. Um, we're going to resurface about 77 miles of streets this year, 1,000 infrastructure plans reviewed, over 100 million in bond, 45 million in facilities. We'll complete over 30,000 inspections, with a dollar value of about $400 million in annual inspections. And like the previous two departments, we're also on board for the implementation of electronic plan review, which is going to be a multi-department. But uh, obviously, as we work towards that, this is going to hopefully make a lot of things more efficient for not only public, but private plans as well, hopefully by the end of the calendar year. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about the Public Works budget for fiscal year 20. Uh, quadrant pothole filling, and I think that's a great idea. How are you going to allocate the people? Are you going to base it on population or number of calls? So right now we're just looking at simple geographies. So I mean, I think if we just break the city into four generally equal quadrants, but the idea would be if we do get an overload of potholes in a particular area, not all crews will be based in that form. The, the staffing is being arranged so that we have a supervisor that would be over each of those quadrants. The 13 crews that we have, we're proposing to increase that by three this year. Um, but the idea that we can allocate the number of crews to the quadrants that are in need, but that they're supervised by quadrants to address those holes as quickly as possible. I definitely like the proactive idea also. Um, you, this just came up with uh, my wife and I just driving around on uh, down on Reno and on Rockwell, we noticed how many traffic signs there are that seem to be completely unneeded. You know, and uh, you know, you, the the number was seventy thousand traffic control signs. And I, I would say in that area, just looking around, like, is that sign really needed? Do, so, do we have any? Um, is there any sort of? Do we review those to? Like, why is that sign there? So, <laughs> you know, most, most if not all the signs that are placed, I would say, have been placed over a period of time. I mean, mm -hmm. most of the signs are placed either through, if we talk about stop signs, yield signs, um, identification signs in neighborhoods, those are placed by private developers as those neighborhoods are constructed. Yeah. We simply maintain those. When we get into arterial streets, um, there are some guides that Public Works uses on the distance, say, between and how many speed limit signs there are or of course, you've got warning signs for school districts and school zones and things that follow certain guides. There probably are a lot of no parking signs that are also in the right of way. Some may which not be valid any longer that we could do a review, but most of the regulatory signs, speed limit, stop, yield, school zone, they're really following a, a practice and a principle that's identified either by the MUTCD, the Uniform Traffic Control Device Guide, or um, some other of the policies that we may have to follow, whether it's a state highway or some other type of roadway. Okay. So now, we do not have a proactive, but it's something we could look at if there's some complaint areas, we can investigate those areas. Well, it, it's almost signs that you don't even notice. I mean, on Reno, you know, it's split. And so there's this sign in the median basically telling you there's a median. 
it's kind of like, I don't know if that's required or I mean it just it doesn't seem to be needed. And then the the do not enter signs because you, it's one there's a one way and a do not enter sign because it's split because it's yeah. a split road and so a lot those of those are just confusing to me because Reno is not a one way. Right. A lot of times we'll find that some of those additional signs that could be placed, the do not enters or the median signs, um, come either following uh, a concern with maybe a safety or a traffic accident that could have occurred in the area, um, just to help clarify for drivers. Um, but absolutely, I guess my commitment would be we can re-review yeah. those areas if we need to. I'm happy to work with you on no, specific it's, Yeah, it's just locations. like by the time you realize what that sign is actually saying, yeah. you probably shouldn't be looking at it that long. Okay. You know? Just just a, th just a thought I had. The I was going to say, can I? Can we have some of his signs since he has too many? Uh, we need some signs, so I, I'll gladly take those signs off your hands. Not a problem. So, so the Not same. Sure if we legal, have, but you can pull them up if you want. <laughs> and if there's some concern areas in Ward Seven, please let us know. I mean, we'd like to review those, and so both both ways, either the addition or the removal of. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. So our next budget hearing will be on the 28th, and that'll be utilities, parks, planning, and airports. And between those, if there's anything you have questions on, we'd be glad to get information for you. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you, Craig, and thanks to everybody. Uh, that brings us to item six, items from council. We'll start with Ward 1. Uh, yes. So two things I'd like to say. One, uh, with Councilwoman Hammond last week, uh, I had the honor of riding along Classen from Stone Cloud Brewery uh, to Northwest 16th Street in Classen, where um, a young man was, as we know in the media, uh, was reported that he was hit in a, uh, by a car in a hit and run. He was biking from downtown home. And um, so many of my friends knew him, I did not but I felt compelled as someone who rides a bike to join in that ride. And as I was in that ride, I was thinking a whole lot about the history I've been researching in the city. And I, I look at Classen, and I, I guess I kind of want everyone to rethink Classen with me. Um, when it was designed originally, I learned, you know, everyone lived down here, downtown by the river, made sense. It was where we brought in the goods, right, through the railroad or the river itself. Um, and then as we expanded out to where I live, the Paseo, where once that was farm and country land, and even Heritage Hills at 13th Street, the only way that we could convince people I've learned to move out there was with reliable public transportation because in the 10s, the 20s, the 30s, most people couldn't afford a car. And so most people walked or they rode a bike. And then John Chartel and Anton Klassen built and operated a streetcar, reliable public transportation that would connect people from Heritage Hills, from Mesta Park, from Paseo, from Crown Heights, out to the Belle Isle amusement park that would have been constructed in the 1930s where presently Nordstrom's and Walmart call home. So when I was on class and then last week with over 100 people riding our bikes on six different traffic lanes, all I could imagine was what once upon a time that median would have looked like when it was the streetcar. And I see an opportunity here as we're about to bring online bus rapid transit that, you know, six lanes. Well, what happens when on each side of the road we were to have a dedicated bus rapid transit lane the way they do in other cities with bus rapid transit? You already have that median there, so you have this beautification opportunity, right? So you have that. You'd have two traffic lanes on either side. You would have a dedicated BRT lane. And then we could create a protected bike lane. You know, Bike Walk OKC, I've learned, was really thoughtful and it involved a lot of outreach to the community, especially the cycling community. And in Bike Walk, they have bike lanes on Chartel and on Western. But that was because people said they didn't feel safe on Classen. And I don't think when we asked those people at the time, I don't think we asked them to imagine the possibility of bus rapid transit being there too. And I think if you were to ask them again right now, the biking community and the cycling community, where they would want a protected bike lane, and they're telling me, and I'm sure Councilwoman Hammond's hearing it too, they're telling me passionately and unequivocally they want a protected bike lane on Classen Boulevard. 
And I think with bus rapid transit coming, we have an opportunity as we work with the design engineering firm to do that, to truly create a boulevard that would be two traffic lanes, dedicated lane for bus rapid transit, a protected bike lane, and we could be so clever with what those protections look like in terms of stones or, um, I mean, I've, there are examples all across the world of what a protected bike lane would look like. And we've set the example almost out here where it's just a painted one, but I'm talking an actual protected with barriers lane for people to ride safely to the grocery store, to work, to shop, to school, to parks, and it was in our founding in the, already. And I didn't really stop to think about that until I was on Classen last week on that bike ride. That is how Classen and Chartel set up that street in the first place. So I'm ready to start really bringing that to our attention as bus rapid transit comes online and as we move into maps. I, I just think it's right there in our history. So that would be my item from council this morning. Um, thank you. Thank you. David? Yeah, I do have a few things. Uh, echoing Councilman Cooper's uh, discussion of the bike ride last week, I also want to make sure people know that Bike to Work Day is this Friday, um, and there will be rides across the city um, into downtown, specifically to Myriad Gardens, before um, dispersing to wherever folks work. So I want to invite any, anyone from Council to join us. Um, I don't know if who else is going, but I'll be there. Um, also on Sunday, there's going to be a critical mass. We're meeting at McKinley Park. Um, and so for those of you not familiar with the idea of a critical mass, it's again uh, an event to promote cyclist visibility and, um, and just bring attention to the fact that the, the cycling community is really wide and diverse um, and includes people who get, use their bikes to get to work, um, to healthcare, to gro the grocery store, as well as all the folks who recreationally ride. Um, so I'd love to invite anyone watching online um, or on the television to join us on that as well. And that's all I have. Um, I just want to make mention uh, this Saturday, 1 OKC is happening on Northeast 23rd Street. So I want to invite all everyone here and, and watching and listening to come and experience uh, the renaissance of what's happening on Northeast 23rd from Rhode Island to, I believe, Hood Street. And also uh, the artist boot camp that's happening on Sunday, May 19th. So we kind of heard about it last week, but uh, if you want to find out more, I'm sure you can do that on our website, okc.gov. But it's it's very uh, it's great information for those who want to be a part of the artist pool process. And I just want to encourage those artists out there to be a part of the artist boot camp uh, for future. And I, I was going to make mention about an article that was published yesterday, but I'm going to wait till next week to explore that a little further. So we'll talk about it next Tuesday. Okay. Hey, um, do you know the exact times of 1 OKC on Saturday? It's 12 to 4. Okay, great. All right. That concludes uh, items from Council, City Manager Reports. I don't have any. Okay. Uh, we have no citizens that have signed up to be heard which means we have concluded our business today and we are adjourned.